Welcome, everyone. Um, we have Dr. Paul Chichanowski, who is an associate professor of psychiatry here with us, the university, where he is director of the UW Psychosomatic Medicine Fellowship. He has a background as a board certified family physician and is board certified in psychiatry. He has received funding through NIH to study the impact of the patient provider relationship on treatment adherence and outcomes in diabetes and other chronic illnesses. He has also received funding through NIH, CDC, and other organizations to investigate depression in patients with medical illness, um, such as the PearlsProgram.org. For the past 13 years, he has combined his experience in psychiatry and primary care in his clinical psychiatric work in the Diabetes Care Center at UW. Dr. Chichnowski is an affiliate investigator at Group Health Research Institute, where he is a co-investigator on the Teen Care Intervention Program for treating depression, diabetes, and heart disease. He dedicates half his time as director of a training institute, the University of Washington, that provides behavioral skills based and program based training and education to healthcare providers in mental health and primary care settings. Current program based offerings include PEARLS, Team Care, and CALM, which stands for Collaborative Care Treatment for Anxiety in Primary Care. Dr. Chiknowski is founder of SamePage, that is samepagehealth.com, an educational, educational and consulting company providing tools, training, and consulting to improve healthcare communication. Dr. Chiknowski. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm told I have to stand at this uh, podium, so I'll do my best to do that. Um, <laughs> so um, I have a question I want to start, and, and again, thank you for the nice welcome. I have a question. How many of you, um, other than your core training in psychiatry or medical school or whatever, how many of you have ever done programs or clinical training and clinical skills training of any kind? Hands up. Hands up. I want to see. Come on. All right, so so how, what? Just shout out what kind of training did you do? Uh, an internship. So outside of your core training for, for your program, have you ever done any courses of any kind, like uh, skills-based training of any kind, skills training, clinical skills? Yes, Larry. Communication. Communication. Okay. Counseling. Counseling. Right. Wh who else had their hand up? I want to see what the hands. Put your hands back up. Yes, May. Motivational interview. I knew that one would come up. Okay, what else? Problem solving therapy. Problem solving therapy. Nice. Anything else? Anyone else done anything other than that? So, so we've had people doing various skills training in addition to the things that they do. How many of you are trainers or providers of that kind of, of clinical skills training? One. Just one of you. Come on, come on, I know there's more of you here. All right, three of you, okay, good. And I'm sure in, on the other part of the uh, um, camera here, there's other people in the audience. Uh, and then I wanna know, how many of you do some of your continuing education either online, any of your continuing education, either online or through a smartphone? One, okay. In, in about two or three years, if I did this, I know there'd be a lot more. Uh, and that's the future, folks. And today what I want to talk about is, is taking um, what some of you have done and some of you teach and the technologies and talk about a platform where we've integrated the three. And, and I, again, I say this is where things are going. This is where all the indicators are that technology is going to change the way we do a, adult learning in clinical work. And we'll speak to a little bit about that. So um, as Sharon said, I've been involved with this training institute or center for training for some time and I have a few people in the room that I'm going to introduce a little later that have helped me with this. I certainly couldn't do it alone. Um, so today what we're going to talk about though is the integration not only of the clinical based training but also of technologies and research. In the title you've got UW Psychiatric and other research 
and how that all fits in to create clinic ready programs. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the barriers to that transition. The, the barrier going from bench to bookshelf to bedside, usually we think about it bench to bedside, but tr in truth, 70 or 80% of the time, it usually goes from bench to bookshelf. And if we made it more contemporary, be bench to bites with a Y, um, because it's really about, and we're incentivized for creating publications about our research, but we're not necessarily incentivized to get traction in the real world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about, the challenge of that. Secondly, if we were to fix this problem, I'm going to talk about how we might fix that problem. What, what would the solutions be? And we'll all together kind of look at that. And then thirdly, I want to talk about learning management systems. How many of you have heard of a learning management system or LMS before? A few of you, yeah. So by the end of this hour, you'll know what an LMS is. And you can go to your cocktail party and tell people, I just heard about this thing called an LMS. And, and you know, and impress everybody with all the new things you've <laughs> learned. So anyway, um, so that's the, the three things we're going to talk about. So I want to thank you for taking time out of your day coming here um, to take a listen to this. And um, I also want to thank the following organizations. I really want to thank the Department of Psychiatry for helping us all along, not only with the beginnings of this, but with some recent transitions that I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, in particular, Richard and John have helped us most recently, Richard Veith and John O'Laughlin. Um, I want to thank CHAMP. CHAMP is the Center for Healthcare Improvement for Addictions, Mental Illness, and Medically Vulnerable Populations. There, I said it. It's almost as long as my last name, and so they truncate it, and it's CHAMP here. And in particular, I want to th thank uh, three people that are in the room here. But first of all, before I thank those three people, there's a couple of people that aren't in the room. Peter Royburn and Tony Krupski, who really supported this uh, development, and I want to acknowledge them. But there are three people that were partners in crime that are with me here, and they're all embarrassed here, but Eddie Edmondson, uh, um, and Zandra Grissom and Allison Waddell. Um, Allison and I started this about four years ago, and then Eddie quickly joined, then Zandra joined, and we, we really have tremendous synergy, I have to say, um, that complements, and there, there is tremendous synergy in developing this, and maybe we'll, I'll speak to that a little bit later. The other uh, group I want to thank is the Center for Commercialization. That used to be called Tech Transfer here at the University of Washington, so it's, it, it's not affiliated with any one department. And it's now called the Center for Commercialization, or C4C. And we've developed a partnership, or have integrated a lot of what I'm going to be talking about together with C4C. And the person that started that is also in this room, Gail Dykstra, who uh, was really uh, at the forefront of bringing this to the attention of the people that she works with. And, and, and really, over the last year, we've, we've sort of developed, we started last December, and it's been a, a wonderful relationship, and we're, uh, you'll see where we've gotten with this. So we've, we, we're very excited about developing this with the Center for Commercialization. Um, and, and including Gail Dykstra, uh, Fiona Wills, and Lyndon Rhodes have also been real sponsors of this. The Health Promotion Research Center, uh, which helped us with the initial stages of developing training. And then finally, the Centers for Disease Control, which helped us with some of the original content, but also some of the process of this. You've already heard about, um, I don't even think this is a conflict or anything, but um, they always ask me to mention my disclosures. So I don't know if this is a conflict. I don't think so. Um, so anyway, um, the problem. So let's start with the problem. What is the problem? So again, you know, if we think about research, if we think about research, and by the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the UW is the public institution in the country that receives the most federal research funding, correct, Gail? Yes, yes, Gail would know that. Um, and, and that's incredible. And, and frankly, that means that we do a lot of research, basic research, clinical research. And in our department, we do a lot of research. And a lot of it's clinical. And so what we have is a constant pipeline of evidence that's coming down the pipeline that, um, as the title s says, may become um, a, a publication which is great as a first step, but we're hoping then to move it further along. And so as we're thinking about that, and so if you look at the, the, um, 
the continuum here from bench. So let's let's just say whether it's bench. They use bench to bedside, right? So if you think of a be, you know bench, the first ideas you you're in the lab or whatever, or you just have an idea, the first proof of concept. You know, you you might do a pilot study, ten people, fifty people, whatever it is. You've got an early proof of concept, and those are your data that you can use for maybe a grant. And then you move to a clinical trial, and you work hard, and five years later, you start to get some data, and then lo and behold, you finally, after maybe a few revisions and, and so on and so forth, there's some chairs at the front for the people that are sitting at the back, or yeah, there we go. Um, it, it, you finally get a publication, and then it often stops there, as I said at the beginning. And there's a gap between the next step, between publication and bedside, maybe as big as, say, the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so I, I was giving a talk on this uh, in Phoenix two weeks ago, so I thought, well, when in Arizona, um, where's there big gaps in Arizona other than maybe budgets or something or the difference between their uh, the pr home prices over the last three years? Those are, there's a huge gap there, too. But... Um, Anyway, so if we think about that huge gap, how do we fill that gap? What is that? Well, first of all, before we talk about that gap, what is the, does that gap consist of? So if we go to the other side of the canyon and look at this gap, what w I'm going to ask you, if we were to think about this, so let's say I'm a researcher and I just publish something, it's a clinical trial, and it's successful, and we know from evidence that it's, it has great promise not only was it funded by a, a NIH or CDC or some other uh, organization, but hey, we got great results. You know, mean effect size was 0.67 or something like that. Wow. And everyone loving it. You go to meetings and everything. And then what happens? How do we get that to actually turn into an intervention that people use? So what are some, and, and for any of you, but particularly the researchers, what are some of the barriers that occur between that publication and it actually becoming an intervention that's used at the bedside or in a clinic. So who wants to say something here? Yes, at the back. So the cost, so resources to do this, to move this into the real world, absolutely. So cost is a big one. What else? Cost is always big. That's, you can say cost for everything <laughs> as a problem, and you're always right, especially these days. Um, what else? What are other barriers, especially the research? How, who's the researcher, uh, researcher here? Yes, you have something. Training, right. So you, you have to think about how do you do this training and how do you scale this training and how do you do it effectively? How do you maintain fidelity? I'm just elaborating a little bit on what you said. What else? Yes, Larry. System support, administrative support. Administrative support, meaning administrative support for you as the researcher or for the... For the integration of the new, new practice style. Right. So, so you, so you might do the best training, but if there isn't s uh, administrative support for the pickup of that and integration into a system, then it all falls flat. Very good. Yeah. There also has to be clinical buy-in. There has to be clinical buy-in. Absolutely. There has to be clinical buy-in. Of course, having a good paper and a good journal helps with that. You know. Um, but it, you're right. So at the organizational level, there has to be a champion and a leader that can make this happen amongst a cadre of clinicians. Anything else? Yeah? What about I mean, public support? I mean, some cancer treatments get fast-tracked because they have huge public lobbies behind Great. Them. Yeah, so public support. So for those interventions where there's a lot of public support, that might fast-track things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and there's always, you know, What's the cutting edge thing in the news every, you know, so if you say, if you put in your proposal, and this aligns with patient-centered medical home and health care reform, you're going to get more traction than if you don't say that, right? Um, so public initiatives and so on would be helpful. Well, here's a few things, and, and I guess the other way of looking at this, as we think about it, as a researcher myself, looking at it both from the outside in structurally, but from the inside out as a researcher, and the, the truth is, you know, you're a researcher. You've got a team, right? You've got, you're paying salaries. You've been successful. You're in the middle of your current RCT. Things are going wonderfully. You're thinking two years ahead. Now you're starting to write another grant or two, or these days maybe eight more grants <laughs> to, to get funding to make sure that you can continue to support your sal salaries that you have to. 
And then you get your results, and then you have to publish the results, and that's, there's a long gap and things just kind of just go along. You're a steward of this. This is your baby. You know, you maybe thought of this in the first place. Now you have some evidence. And it's a real pain point for the researcher because then, you know, the traction is gone. You know, it's hard to get traction. And it's hard. You don't have the resources. You're already distracted with two or three other grants. You don't have necessarily the skills to get into the messiness of disseminating things in the real world. And you don't have the bandwidth. So how many of you researchers can, uh, you, know, uh, you know, understand that? That is a huge issue. So one of the things that we've decided to do is to create, um, to, to help uh, this along. And so I'll just go over these. These aren't necessarily in any order. But if you wanted to make a change and get early traction, someone mentioned training earlier. You have to train folks. But what we've learned is that usually when we write protocols for clinical trials or you know uh, clinical interventions they're usually tomes this thick that maybe were written in a pilot study or maybe submitted and so on and they're not necessarily ready for prime time for teaching cadres of clinicians from the community and so one of the things you have to do is you have to distill that material and create adult learning material that's one of the first things and believe me I know this you know how I know this because we made the mistake of using big tomes for the first three years of one of our clinical interventions as we tried to develop this. And people would be falling asleep in our trainings. And we said, we're not doing something right here. And people were flipping around in this 200-page thing. And we said, wait a second, we've got to do something different. So Eddie Edmondson uh, came along. And we started to distill these things, take the tomes, and distill them into small booklets put the t tomes on a DVD, stick them in the back of the form, but we went even one step further. We further distilled that 20-page version or 30-page version into single pieces of paper that were color-coded. This is something that Eddie came up with, and it's perfect. Because guess what? If people are flying from across the country to do your training, they want to get back home and be doing some kind of clinical... They want to have a new clinical skill, know what to do clinically. They don't want to be obfuscated with all this data and information. They can have that. It's available to them. But they want to really get to the point when they're in the training and leave there and start to implement this in their center, right? The other part about adult learning is how you do it. It's not enough just to go through the book you know, together and read the words together. So, in fact, now in two of our trainings, we start with a demo right up front. We've been doing this with pearls for years. We do a demonstration of the actual intervention. This is a, a problem-solving intervention. 20 minutes. So people walk in. We do a little, hi, how are you? Where are you from? Okay, watch this. And then two clinicians do a demonstration right up front. And then we say, so tell us, what was different about what you do in practice and what you're seeing here? And we draw this out of it, and they start to find the answers. And, and they start to realize, oh, I see. And they learn, discover, and of course they stay awake. And then when we go through the process, okay, now let's go back to how you do this. And then they're going to do it an hour or two later. They've seen it. They've heard it. They've read the, the rationale for why they do it. And then they're doing it within three hours. Believe me, that's the best way to consolidate the learning. And now we're doing this with team care as well. I'll tell you about that later. So in-person trainings require a lot of um, uh, uh, organization. You have to find a venue to do it, uh, which is pro you know, straightforward. But you have to organize it, register, um, you know, market it, which is the next thing down. But also, you have to break even, at least, if you want to sustain this thing. And so um, Allison and I started this a long time ago. And we started with what's called the funnel model. And you'll see that in a moment. <laughs> Allison's laughing because I bring the funnel up every time. If there was a whiteboard here, I'd be drawing you a funnel. When I was at Yale a while ago and I was showing this funnel, well, I'll show you, tell you, but anyway, the funnel that, you know, like this, boom, boom. They said, oh, that's Y for Yale, right? And then in another organization, I drew the funnel, and they said, uh, isn't that a martini glass? Uh, so, but you'll see what the funnel is all about. So this will keep you awake because I'm going to tell you what the funnel is and how it pertains to a business model. It's just about converting people from... Um, B2C customers, business to consumer customers, they come as individual clinicians to maybe going home and getting their organization excited about it because they've learned this new skill and then getting an organizational contract. And that's how we've moved this along. 
But to do that, you know, we have to figure out how to fill the room. So Allison figures out, she runs pro formas for every one of our trainings. And we have, you know, what, where's our break even? How do we get people in our room? And when you have more than one training, one can cross-subsidize the other. You can take a loss on one and so on. And so that's something that you, you might have to consider doing. Uh, marketing is important. We have a, a, a list of about 10,000, no, 12,000 names or emails. Maybe you're on it. Maybe you're trying to figure out, how do I get them to quit sending me emails? So just let us know if that's a, a bother for you. Um, but um, we send these out across the country. And we use other things, cross-marketing, fusion marketing, which I'll tell you about in a moment or a little later. Certification, um, continuing education credits are important for a lot of people. We have to have a website. Website's important. And that's where we can put materials, registration, um, all kinds of other things, information, a business model, which I'll talk about that's sustainable, e-commerce, and contract, and now licenses. We're talking about licenses. So e-commerce meaning, you know, people pay online, and then they can move to contracts if you're working at the level of organizations. And then finally, something we call implementation assistance. You know, it's one thing to just do a two-day training, but when you go back home as a clinician and you want to implement this in your own site, uh, you're going to have bumps in the road because it's not exactly how the study was done or how you got trained or whatever. There, you don't have the same resources. And so we offer those services as well so people can get assistance with implementing it when they get back home. Any questions? Does that make sense? And, you know, there might be seven other things. I don't know. But th these are the core things. So our first solution, publication to national po program. So if the time zero is a publication, um, th 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 this was the publication. This was 2004. This was uh, Pearls. It's called the Pearls Program. And it basically, it's a community integrated home based tre depression treatment program for older adults. We started this in 1999. Ed Wagner was the PI. How many of you know Ed Wagner or heard of him? He's the father or grandfather of the chronic care model. Um, and he developed this. And I, I was a co investigator. And, and we worked on this in the early 2000s. And basically what it is is that in-home intervention, social workers would go into the homes of older adults, who, frail elderly, people that were somewhat marginalized and, and couldn't get to clinics easily, and they'd get six one-hour sessions in one year of problem-solving, behavioral activation, and pleasant events scheduling. And what we found is that the intervention group was three times as likely to have remission from depression as the usual care group based on those six one-hour visits. So that's pretty, pretty uh, robust. Um, and so what we decided to do afterwards, well, actually, let me just go back a step. So afterwards, there were a lot of social service agencies that were interested in this, because actually we worked with social service agencies to do this. And in fact, Ed Wagner was very smart. He says, let's build a program and get a grant for a program, and we have a nested RCT within it. But when we fold up the tent of the RCT, the program's in place. And so Carl Kaiser, who was one of the social workers at Aging and Disability <coughs> Services here in Seattle, is still doing pearls in the community. Um, and so he does our training with us. By the way, that's another thing you want to make sure you do, is you don't want just pointy-headed academics doing the training. You want people like your customers uh, that really know their stuff inside and out doing it with them. And I depend so much on Carl Kaiser to teach pearls and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So we had this intervention, we had this evidence base, and we had people asking us to do the trainings. So like I said, we really did it very haphazardly and not very well at the beginning. It wasn't all that successful, I don't think, but people kept coming and asking to do our training. Probably wasn't word of mouth because I can't imagine <laughs> that anyone would recommend it. And we decided, well, but you know, we need to figure out how to do this better. So that's where we said, how do we, how do we actually do this? So a lot of the things that I showed you in that canyon slide were, were things that we learned along the way. And as we learned them along the way, we realized, hey, we're building a machine here. Um, if we change the content, we still have the infrastructure, and we've learned all the tricks of how to do this. And so one of the things that you have to do is to build, like I said, a website. So this is the Pearls website. And what you can see here is you can register, you can download the training kit. This is that tome that I was talking about. But then there's also other components. Um, you, you can um, look, read stories, you know, and 
you know, find out all kinds of things about the training and so on, the schedule of training. And so that's an important part of this. You want brand identity, just like anything. People want to know what, what you have. If you have a clever name or this logo came out of our training because we'd be drawing on the flip chart. You know, it's two people in a house, right? So when they asked us to develop a, a, a logo, we just decided to go with what we use in our training. That just evolved over time. So since we've been doing this, using this machine that we developed, we're now implementing, now Pearls is in 22 places around the country, and it's growing, um, and we have monthly phone calls, and we're disseminating this around the country. So it worked. Um, and then we got a second grant. Um, this one we just finished two years ago. And we, and just last month, we were in Landover at the epilepsy. This was the this was same study, but in all age adults with epilepsy, again, an in-home intervention that w reduced depression and suicidal ideation in individuals with epilepsy. Again, six one-hour visits in one year. And basically, um, we did a, a, a training. The training institute um, basically held this training at the Epilepsy Foundation headquarters in Landover, Maryland, uh, last month. Um, and we had Carl Kaiser, the person who's been doing this for 10 years in the field, who really knows this stuff. And he's a, a very, very important trainer. So we, we, that's one of the key things that you have to remember about doing training, is get people that are A, doing it in the field, B, um, that, that um, can really just sort of speak in, in regular language. And you know, we, we all complement each other. I can show the, you know, the statistics and talk about it like a researcher. And then he can really just bring it to life from his experiences. All right, so we took the learnings of this. This took some time to get up to speed, but we said, hey, what if we, now that we have this platform in place, what if we were a little more strategic? And what if there was content? Because after all, we said we were going to take content and move this along. What if we planned this strategically? So with the team care study, which I'll tell you about now, this was a, um, a, a randomized control trial looking at depression. Actually, we treated the A, B, C, D, A, A, 1, C, B, blood pressure, C, cholesterol, D, depression. Done at Group Health. Wayne Caton was a PI, and we worked with others at Group Health. And we knew that the publication date, uh, you know, ahead of time was going to be sometime in December of last year. So Wayne came to us and said, yeah, can you help us get a training going? So Eddie started working on the materials, distilling it down to the book with the 10 color-coded inserts or whatever. Um, we got a website going. Um, we got all the materials on the website. We started to think about dates to do the training, and we got a URL and everything. So when we had the press releases, we had the URL in the press releases, and, and we got this into New England Journal of Medicine, which probably didn't hurt to get exposure. And so uh, when people would look at the media reports, they'd they just click on health, what, whatever our, it's uh, teamcarehealth.org, I think, yes. And um, then they could read all about it and download uh, materials. And when they downloaded materials, guess what? They had to register. Guess where we added those emails to our 12,000 emails, right? Okay, well, this is not rocket science. It's just something you have to do, right, if you want to get traction and if you don't want to keep asking for grant money but want to build a self-sustaining system to get this stuff out. So here's the Team Care website, teamcarehealth.org. And, you know, we have a whole team, in including Elizabeth Lynn, Michael Von Korff, and, and others, uh, Yvette Ludman and Joan Russo, Wayne Caton, of course, I mentioned. And so we have, um, we have our... You know, everything here, publications, news, resources, training, and so on. So what I said at the beginning here, right here, training to, okay, so the Institute of Medicine says that it takes 17 years from the inception of an idea or development of a, an idea in medicine until you get traction and, and you know, in the, in the real world, 17 years. I've heard 25 this morning at a research meeting. I heard 25 years. I don't care. Let's say 10 years, whatever it is. It takes a long time. We know that. Well, we did this in nine months. Remember I told you December 30th, 2010? That was the publication of that article. 
This is when we did our first national training here at the World Trade Center in Seattle. We had an overflow crowd. Um, we had people from all over the country. We used our marketing methods. And frankly, um, that same day, it was a two-day training. The second day of that training, I was downstairs closing a deal with a healthcare organization in Seattle that has developed a contract with us to do one year of training for them plus implementation assistance for a whole year with booster trainings and so on and so forth. So we, and they are right now hiring nurses to implement this. We're going to do the training next month, and basically they're going to have a whole cadre of clinicians doing bench to bedside stuff all within, you know, what, 14 months? That's, you know, I think, I, I don't know, I haven't heard of too many programs that get going that quickly. So this is, this is a, a way of accelerating the whole process. Um, so this is an example of a brochure for organizations. Remember B2B, business to business. You, you want to think of it, you have a different strategy than when you're doing B2C, which is to the consumer, to the individual provider. And you want to you have, have different things in place. The other thing that we've done is um, institutional collaboration. We've worked with UCLA on a, an intervention. This was done with P Peter Royburn uh, at Rand Calm. The, uh, a collaborative care intervention for anxiety disorders in primary care. Some of you, are, I'm sure, are very familiar with this. And Michelle Krask at uh, UCLA was a co-investigator or co-PI, and they developed this together. So here we have two institutions where they built this thing. They got it into uh, JAMA. And then, uh, again, uh, so through the, the marketing principles and cross-marketing, and net word of mouth, but knowing that we had a center, Mayo Clinic came along and says, hey, we'd like to learn this. In fact, we want to fly out, you know, 12 or I forget how many people came out, um, 15 people to learn this. Um, and we were still working on the website. So even before we had the website or any of that, we, we'd already done a training within about 15 months with, with Mayo Clinic. And this is his article. Um, randomized control trial, Peter and, and Michelle Krask, done out of Harborview here. Delivery of evidence-based treatment for multiple anxiety disorders in primary care. And you can see this website is there on your screen, but it's hardly ready for prime time. If you look at the words here, Suvlaki Ignatius Carbonato Olympian Quarrels and Gorillas. Um, so, in other words, this is just a prototype that we're still developing. Um, and that should go online when, Allison? A few months January, there you go. So Calm will be, uh, the website will be up, but all of these things are always done. These are all parts of the recipe. You have to have a website, but they don't, you know, if someone comes to you and says, we want a training, oh no, you, you can't do it till we've developed the website. Obviously, we're not going to say that, so we went ahead and did a training this summer, and uh, we're going to continue to do the trainings as we go along. Any questions? All right, so that is where we're at, and I'm going to now tell you where we're going. But first, I want to just say, you know, when you think of the components, we've called this a training institute, we've called this a training center, but in some ways what we've discovered that de facto, we've been creating um, not just a training institute, but also a research training accelerator, fancy word, RTA, do you like that? Um, it, it, it's actually just a placeholder name. I don't know what we're going to call it. But in the business world, they have this idea of a business accelerator. Startups often, they don't have all the resources, but boy, they could use some help with marketing or corporate development or personnel in key areas. So in some ways, what we've discovered is that we have been offering this. We have two customers. We have the external customer, the, the clinicians and organizations that get our training, but we also have the internal customer. That, those are the content providers, the team cares of the world, the calms of the world, the pearls of the world, right? Who say, remember we talked about the pain point? I, I'm already on to grant number four here, but this just got published and I need some help with this. Can you help me with this? And that's what we've developed, is a tra translation accelerator and essentially to give them help with, with de developing the materials, getting the training out there. So let me tell you a little bit about how you make this sustainable. This is, the, this is where the funnel comes in. So it's either the Y for Yale or the martini glass, or maybe it's just a funnel, right? And basically why we use a funnel is this. And if anyone's offended by talking about money in a grand rounds, just close your eyes and, and, and I'll tell you when you can open your eyes again. But this is about money. You have to build a model, okay? 
if you want to make something sustainable, you have to talk about money. Well, actually, everybody's talking about money, money they don't have these days. So we're going to be talking about it anyway. So either you're going to have money or you're not. So if you build models that, where you, you can make money, that's probably a good thing. And if, you go to, if you, you're depending on grants to, to build these things, guess what? You may not be successful because there's less and less money. So you want to be smart about this. So remember we had pearls for older adults. All right, so how do we now build a business model with that? So first we had pearls for older adults, and then we had all these other products. And then we added motivational interviewing, which Chris Dunn and, and Grin um, does, and, and Eddie. We have a team doing motivational interviewing. Um, Kate Comtois is doing um, um, self-harm and suicide, suicide and self-harm for clinicians. And so we have now a whole bunch of products. And essentially how this works is um, you, you have these lines of development of this. It's, again, this is just like screening for a randomized controlled trial. You, you, know, you, you want to convert people. You screen them. You bring them in. Some of them then convert to, to participants in a way. But really what it is is you've got all these products, and what you can do is offer a showcase. So what we've done actually for the last three years or so with CHAMP is we have a ch showcase. We add massive value. We have these workshops for people in the Whammy region. They come to the CHAMP showcase and they say, and, and we offer them training in problem solving, behavioral activation. We had a keynote speaker talking about team care. Stacy Shaw Welch was talking about anxiety from the Calm study. We had Chris Dunn there talking about motivational interviewing. We had Kate Comtois. You get the point. And all of these things are lines of development, right? And so we even subsidized this. We lost money on this. Okay, we lost a little money on this because we charged hardly anything to get them in the room. But if you get three or 400 people in the room and they go home and they're excited about having learned something, oh, and by the way, we happen to have one to two day trainings in these things. If you like what you just tried and are gonna be trying out Monday in your clinic, you might wanna learn the whole thing here and you can come back to our one or two day training. And of course, some of those people that come to your one or two day training then come back and say, or call you and say, can you come to us? Can you fly out to us to do it? We have 25 people and we say, well, why don't you fly up here? And we, we know that that's not gonna make business sense to them. It's much better for us to fly down there to train their, it's cheaper for them and it's a win-win. And then finally, like this organization that I told you about that just signed a contract with us, not only do they get tailored treatment or training in their center, but they also get implementation assistance with the original investigators. And so those are contracts that we develop. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And what are the benefits of this? Well, guess what? The people that signed the contract with us, did they learn about team care by reading the New England Journal article? They didn't because they didn't know about it. But guess what? They were at a Pearls training. And we, were just ha we just happened to be talking about all our other products. But we also had lunch with one or two of them. And, said, and they said, you know, we have a real, real difficulty with diabetes. And we said, do we have the program for you? We, do you know this collaborative care thing you just did with Pearls? Well, we have something called team care. Might you be interested? And then that led to one discussion after another. And next thing you know, we, we're, we're signing a contract with them. And actually, they've also had Chris Dunn come and do a motivational interviewing talk. Not so bad. This is where you talk about brand loyalty. Now they say, hey, this is, this is a place where we'd like to go and get our training done. All right. So now we're moving to the next level. Um, so what about scaling all this? And this is where Gail Dykstra comes in. Um, to the whole picture. She, she, so she caught me in the hall one day, and I don't remember exactly how it happened, but said, Paul, she knew about this, she says, can we talk? I think we'd like to do something like this, and you know, we have some ideas, and you have some ideas. What if we started to integrate technology into this? You're doing in-person trainings. What if we kind of brought this all together with some, some uh, technologies like learning management systems. And we said, sure, because Gail's actually been working with people who have online trainings, a number of them, which I'll mention later, and there's something missing, and that's the secret ingredient, which is the learning management system. You can have online things, but if you don't have a way of storing results, that's a completely different thing, and I'll tell you a little more about that. 
Now, if this looks complicated, it's supposed to be, <laughs> because it is. But I'll try to simplify it here. So this is the technology that we're developing right now. Since July, we've been developing this at the Center for Training or Center for Commercialization. And so on the left side here, you have the lecture capture platform, content authoring platform. So we've actually built this. We're using independent contractors out in the field who are, they have expertise in videography, graphics, and basically we're working with them, taking our materials from some of our talk, some of our presentations from Pearls, Team Care, Calm, whatever it is, we send it to them, we send them a script, they send us back a thing with two columns, our script and then their video ideas, graphics and everything. We finally approve it and then they make a video of it and they, we put a voiceover on it, and that's, we're in the process of finishing that December 7th, our, I mean, I think some of our Pearls ones here. And, and th these are, well, I'll tell you more about what these are in a moment, but that's how you create it. You can either do it that way, or you can just do what we're doing right now. Hello, out there. <laughs> Capture this with a camera, right? And if I was saying something important, then you could actually, you know, um, put this on and, and ask questions about it and have a questionnaire and score people's result, you know, results and everything. Um, but basically, so that's the studio part, right? The other parts of this is the learning management system, which again has a back end. People have to register. They do the course. They view something. They answer some questions. It goes in the back end. There's a database. If you can see at the bottom here, there's an audit trail, there's report generation, there's certification for continuing education credits, there's pre-post results so you can look at implementation fidelity, and this all is then fit into a website and a storefront where we have an e-commerce platform and, and, uh, and other things that kind of make it all kind of user friendly. And that is like the transmission system. If you think of this is like a television station, you've got the studio, then you've got some way of distributing this, right, to the world. And then finally, you have this part here, which is the courses themselves. And so, you know, you can have synchronous courses like a webinar, sort of like what we're doing right now. It's synchronous, it's in real time. People at the U are watching it at the UWMC, but you can also then look at it afterwards because it's going to be recorded, right? And then, um, but what if, um, What's really attractive these days, when I ask that question about CME, I do a lot of my CME now on my iPhone. If I'm in an airport airline, I can do psychiatry CME on here, answer some questions, and by the time I get on the plane, I've just done you know, maybe a half or an hour's credit, and I get, it's free. Um, and you know, people are busy. So if you can make self-paced programs, cl busy clinicians, if they have to learn something, if they can do it on their iPad or other tablet or on their iPhone, they're more likely to do it. Now, am I saying that all the courses should be that done that way? Absolutely not. But certain parts of the material can be done that way, and then certain parts might still need to be done in person. And so that's this thing, using smartphones and computers, right? That's where the world's going, folks, right? Pearson is a learning management system that just was, I, I think they just de developed a, an alliance with Google, and they recognize this. This is where things are going. I mean, l my kids are doing courses online th through their, you know, my daughter's doing Running Start, and all, a lot of her courses are, are online. Um, There's some kids in her class, she's in 12th grade, that are at home doing online courses. They decided, I don't want to go to school anymore, but they're doing just as well. They're, they're getting their school finished online, and they're working. This is the future, folks. <laughs> it's here. Uh, multiple entry points in the research cycle. So let's finish up here. Just a few more slides. So we've closed this gap. There's no Grand Canyon here anymore. Uh, and here's, here's this line of development. So you've got the pilot study, the clinical trials, the study results, and dissemination. And so here are the products, where they came in. So we started with this after we published results. With Team Care, we developed everything before the results were published. With our second Pearl study, we actually started to do this. In fact, little secret, institutions, uh, funding agencies love this. We got an unsolicited call from a funding agency saying, can we send you money? <laughs> oh, okay. What do we have to do? Nothing. Just can we send it to you? Sure. Um, well, see, we know that you've got these results coming up, and we'd like to really, uh, someone was talking about, you know, 
condition-specific advocacy and so on. These people really want to make a change with epilepsy, and they gave us money to develop this institute because they knew we had this training institute. People are very interested in this. Could you put this in a grant? Could you have five lines in a grant that says, we have a training institute, and as soon as we're done our results, we have a track record of getting things out in the field within nine months. Do you think you could write that into a grant? Do you think a grant reviewer might look at that favorably? That's what I have here. Um, you know, include that in the grant. Absolutely. So other courses, Mark Sullivan's Co COPES program. He has, he's had for years an online program, but he doesn't have a learning management system, a back end, and that's what we're working with them on right now. Spirometry 360 out of the Department of, of um, Pediatrics, um, looking at COPD and asthma in kids and also in older adults. And they're very successful. They have programs all over the world, but they don't have a learning management system. They don't have a back end. So we're, we're potentially working with them. We're starting negotiations with them right now. And they also have webinars that they'd like to record and create self-paced products. So we're working with them on that as well. And you've already heard about Calm and so on. And then finally, you can get real-world data from this learning management system that feeds new ideas, either about the training or you might get other ideas about the way things are implemented in the real world, in the community. Does that make sense? Okay. So just to finish up, what are the features of the Center for Training? Well, first of all, our specific goal is to change clinical practice, not just to transfer knowledge. God knows we are so good in academia at doing data dumps with PowerPoint slides and transferring knowledge. And the, the fact is that that doesn't always translate into clinical change. No. You've got to do it in a way, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. You've got to get people to see it. You've got to transfer a little bit of knowledge. They can read about it later. You've got to get them to try it out. You've got to do it in that way. You want to provide clinic-ready training products, things that, you remember, these are adult learners. They're flying across the country with real problems. And, you know, one of the first things that they're not telling you, if you don't win them over in the first half hour, like, What's in it for me, they're wondering, as they're getting texts from the daycare center you know, across the country, and they're all stressed out, and they're going, why did I come out here again? If you can't solve their problems, how to make them a better clinician, solve their daily clinical problems, you're not helping them. If you give them a data dump, they're not going to come back to a training program. So you need to have things that are clinic ready. So one of our points that we say is, Monday morning, you're going to be able to do this in your clinic. And if you're not in clinic Monday morning, you can do this with your kids or your partner or your spouse. <laughs> Problem solving or whatever it is. Use proven research programs as the content. That's, that's one of the things that differentiates us from other CME courses. We're a pipeline, an extension of the research um, trajectory here at the UW. There's so much rich research here, and we're a continuation of that. We're not a review course of diabetes. Lots of people can do that and we'll even do their courses, we'll even take their courses. They're great at that. That's not what this is. This is taking what we're developing here and extending the research cycle and then maybe studying it and making it better. We offer custom training services. We offer custom training services, working with organizations and, and integrate in-person and online trainings to customize it to people's needs. Include content developers. So even if someone's on their third or fourth next grant, can they be a cameo? Absolutely. You want them to be. So, do you think people would fly across the country to see the original developer of some of these things if they were there for two hours of the training? Absolutely. And similarly, with our tr online training, you want videos of these people that can speak to their babies, the things that they created. This is their baby. This is, they're champions of this, right? And so that's what we're doing. Provide targeted training and implementation assistance, not only to frontline clinicians, but also to administrators and clinical supervisors. One thing we've learned is that a lot of these people, even if they're clinicians, also have administrative roles. When they get back home, they're not so worried about, can I do problem solving well or not? They're worried about, how am I going to get this d implemented in my organization? I'm responsible for this. So what we start to do is a breakout for two hours in our two-day trainings. We'll have a breakout, and we'll bring all the administrators into the room. Mark Snowden, who's not here today, is brilliant at this. So for Pearls, even when we were in Washington, D.C., or Landover last month, Mark, can you be available at 8 o'clock or whatever? It was 8 here, 11 there. 
And Mark just is brilliant around talking about funding, policy issues, and so on for implementing PEARLS. He's done grants on implementation of this. So you want to work with administrators in the training. It's not just for the clinicians. I'm almost finished here. You want to offer performance feedback, timely targeted booster trainings, provide the option of secure patient data entry portals. That's something that we're working with Mayo right now on is they don't want we have some online uh, modules to do calm study. This is a training, you know, so a clinician can work with a laptop and work with a patient. But they, Mayo said, you know, if you're entering any clinical data, we don't want that to go to your website or you, you, it needs to come to us. So you have to put it behind our firewall. And we said, wait, wait a second. We know how to create iframes, and we're working on developing a way that if they enter data, it goes to their servers securely. We never see it. And so that's what we're working on with various kinds of uh, programs, iframes. It's, if you think about PayPal, when you go to a website and you pay for something, your credit card information doesn't go to that website. It goes to PayPal. Well, we can do the same thing with clinical modules, right? Yeah. All right, last slide. What are the benefits? Well, we offer tracking and performance feedback to organizations. We minimize drift from original research methods using these and the back end and pre-post te testing, intervention fidelity monitoring. We can increase participation from geographically dispersed areas or if there are resource limitations. And then finally, create new research opportunities through analysis of LMS-generated real-world data. Gail is great. My last slide here. Gail is great at writing down. When, whenever we're in a meeting, she's writing down things, thinking of the next tagline and so on. And yesterday, she had a meeting with someone named Chris in our organization there who said, this is about better learning through better health. And I just flipped it around because, I, I don't know, I like it this way better, but it doesn't matter. This is a great tagline, better health through better learning. I think this is what this is all about. And we think in academia that, you know, we are... I think we do teach well, but I think sometimes as far as clinical learning, we have to think about it's not just about data transfer, and, and it's through better learning and using technologies and using in-person training and using the, the most you know, uh, up-to-date adult learning principles to do this. We're almost out of time, but I have time for questions. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. So does this make sense? Yes, any questions? Any, uh, anything confusing or any, did this, oh, for the people that close their eyes when I had money on there, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, come to our courses if you're a researcher. Um, and if you want to co-develop something, uh, let us know. We'd be, we'd be thrilled to work with you. And we have all kinds of business models uh, to make it equitable and um, make it a win-win-win for everyone. So thanks.